All right, well, we're just going to go ahead and launch into it, and uh, we'll let people come in when they feel like it. So let's start with any questions. Um, homework or lab or the stuff that we started to talk about on Monday, which was uh, sequential circuits, circuits with memory, anything from there. Yeah. For lab four, mm -hmm. All right. Um, it essentially wants us to implement something into Tinkercast and then write a truth table for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done that, but what should we put in the truth table output when nothing shows up on the <clears throat> number thing? So um, you're looking at this part, implement the following circuit in Tinkercad. Simulate the circuit and generate a truth table that matches all binary equivalents of switch values 1 through 4 with observed numbers on the 7 segment display. So, for this, um, you want to go through all 16 combinations of your 4 inputs. And for the output, um, you could list what each of the 7 segments is doing. You could list a 1 to indicate that segment is lit and a zero to indicate it's dark. So if the display looks like this where everything is off, all seven outputs would be a zero. Oh wait, yeah, okay. Right, and then here all seven would be a one. And that's that's truth table is going to show you what you would need to do to build a circuit that generated you know, these things that look like digits in response to a 4-bit input. That's what this chip, this 4511, does. It has the circuitry inside that basically realizes that truth table. And so in, in experiment 2, you're not going to implement that truth table. You're, you're going to use a 4511, hopefully, right? It's a suggestion, a hint. Um, but that, that truth table shows you what you would have to do if, if that chip did not exist. That's what you would have to generate. Um, so, uh, the actual treatment will have seven outputs because seven are uh, seconds, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, and then someone asked Experiment 2, Part 4. Um, draw a schematic to implement the two-bit adder with carry and then implement and test your design. So your design goal is um, allow two two-bit binary inputs perform addition, and then display the result in decimal format using a seven-segment display. So step five here is going to include not only the circuit that you're, you're developing throughout experiment two, but also this decoder chip, the seven-segment display, the resistors for the common lines, and so on and so forth. Your schematic that you include in step four has got to match what you implement in step five. So the short answer is yes, the schematic should include um, the seven segment decoder and the display. Um, the seven segment decoder is is a bit of an oddball, right? We don't have logic gates that we can use, like with AND gates we have a, a half moon symbol we use, with inverters we have a triangle that we use, but there's no standard symbol for that decoder. So if you go to the component specifications and look up the data sheet on that, you'll see a compromise. So, so what you don't really want to do is just draw a picture of the chip, right? So, so uh, let me get focus here. So for a forty-five eleven, don't do this, and then I'll show you what you can do. All right, so so I don't know if it's seven pins or eight pins, but don't do this, right? Don't draw a picture of the actual chip and then show which pins you connect to, right? That's that's useful for wiring the chip, um, but it's not terribly useful for looking at the schematic and understanding what the schematic says. 
So if you look at the picture of the chip, it's actually a 16-pin chip. If you look at the picture in the data sheet, these pins have names associated with them. The outputs are labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The inputs are labeled D0 through D3, and then there's three other inputs, lamp test, uh, blank, and uh, LE. And so, so my suggestion for drawing the 4511 is go ahead and draw a box and label it, you know, CD4511. But the connections to this don't, don't feel like they have to be in the actual order of the pin numbers. You could label these, you know, D0, D1, D2, D3, and feed those, you know, this is going to come from S0, S1, S2, and D3 is going to go to ground because you're only feeding in a 3-bit number. So, so show the component, you know, with a rectangle, label it, you know, or label it, you know, with a U5. Um, but then put down the names of what each of these pins are, and then go ahead and put the pin numbers next to them the way we usually do. So this is pin 7, this is pin 1, this is pin 2, this is pin 6. And then on the outputs, you know, A through G, now you can draw a 7-segment display. And, you know, label those accordingly. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then make your connections. Draw it neater than I'm drawing it here. So, in other words, if we don't have a logic gate symbol that, that's, you know, standardized, go ahead and just draw a rectangle and label the inputs and outputs according to their function typically from like this picture in the beginning of the data sheet and then go ahead and put your pin numbers next to the pins and and make life easier on yourself right you don't need to put d0 down here and d1 up here and d3 back down here right you can arrange these however you like just like when you draw an and gate symbol right these pins might not be next to each other on the physical chip that's okay i just lost my Ooh. I don't know why Zoom keeps doing this. I just lost my audio and my screen share. So we'll try this again. All right, hopefully that holds. Um, so yeah, draw a rectangle, put these, these pins where they're convenient, label them, and then put the pin numbers next to them. All right, other questions? All right. Well, let's um, let's keep going. Oh, I lost my other camera too. This is a bad technology morning. Let's restart that. All right, well, we started talking about um, sequential behavior on Monday, and this was the idea of, of circuits that include memory. So um, we said the first half of the course we've been talking about circuits that you can describe their behavior by looking at the combination of inputs. And so those, those are called combinational circuits. And what we're moving into now are called sequential circuits. And a sequential circuit depends not only on the inputs right now, but on the sequence of inputs that you've seen 
over some period of time. And so we started by looking at um, a series of gates or latches and the main the main mechanism for building these devices was to have inverting logic, so NAND gates or NOR gates. <coughs> and drive them like this. So we have some output and I'm going to call the output X. And if we try to analyze this circuit, we don't know for sure what the output's going to be unless we know what the output is to begin with. So if this output is a zero, then we're going to get a zero going into this NOR gate, while the output in the NOR gate depends on this input. But if the output is a 1, we know that the input to this NOR gate is going to be a 1. The OR will be 1, and so the NOR will be a 0. But then we've got a 0 coming in up here, and we don't know the output of this gate unless we know the value of this input. So let's look at these inputs. If this input is a 1, what is the output of the NOR gate going to be? So let me get rid of these. And let's just say this input is a 1. What is the output here? Mm-hmm. And it's a 0. So a 1 goes into an OR gate. The output's a 1. You only need one input to be a 1. A NOR gate inverts. So this is a 0. And so we can label this input reset. And anytime reset is high, the output's going to go to a zero. Now suppose reset is low and the output here is a zero. And so you have a zero going in here, but suppose you put a one on this input. Well, same same behavior for this NOR gate. This output's going to go to a zero. And if you have a zero coming in here, now you have two zeros going into a NOR gate. The OR would be zero, the NOR will be one. This will make the output one. And when that one comes down to the input of this lower gate, it doesn't change the output. Now you have two ones instead of a single one, that's okay. The output is still zero. So this input we can call set. And so here's the behavior of this, this SR latch. If reset is a 1, your output goes to 0. Doesn't matter what your set is. If reset is 0 and set is 1, then your output goes to a 1. So this sets or turns on the output. And if both of these are zero, then your output is unchanged. All right, so this is a memory. This is a circuit you can build with a single, you know, NOR gate chip. It's got four NOR gates inside. You can hook them up like this. And if you raise this input to 1 and then send it back to ground, the output goes low. If you raise this high and then return it to ground, the output becomes 1. And this remembers which of these inputs was given a logic 1 most recently. And so when both inputs are low, the output could be a 0 or it could be a 1. Which is it? It depends which input was raised most recently. If I raise the reset line, and then I raise the set line, and then I raise the reset line, the output will be a zero. If I raise the set line, now the output will be a one. So we also introduce timing. About that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the way I understand, so for every, if it's like um, connected to each other, for every like possible um, option, there's two solutions. 
It could be a zero or it could be a one. So is that for every possible um, option? Um, that's only if both inputs are zero. Okay. Right, so if either input is a one or if both inputs are one, the output is, is forced to be either a zero or a one. And we can tell exactly what the output's going to be by knowing what the two inputs are. But if the inputs are both zero, we can't say just from that what the output is. Okay. So this is this is confusing because a truth table is really meant to show you, you know, for this set of inputs, what's the output. And so we introduce timing diagrams, and timing diagrams let us look at an output across time. And so we might see something like this. So here's time, and we might have, you know, set, and reset, and X. And let's suppose our reset line starts off high, X is going to be low. And sometimes when we do timing diagrams, you'll see this following notation. You know, here it's pretty clear reset started high and then it dropped low. But from the way I've drawn this, we don't really know if X is high or low. We don't really know if set is high or low. And so sometimes, you know, to indicate this is starting off low, you'll see a little dotted line here in the beginning. And that lets you know, you know, the high level would be up here. So since this is at the bottom level, this is a low. And the same thing with the set. All right, so at this point, reset is low, set is low, X is low. Suppose right here, set goes high, reset stays low, X is going to go high. And then set goes low again, reset stays low, guess what? X stays high. And now you raise the reset line, that drives the output low. And then when reset goes low again, X stays low. So there's there's a better way of describing the behavior of this latch than a truth table. Because we can see how the past values of inputs affect the current output. And the interesting thing here is, right, here's a case where set and reset are both zero, and the output is zero. Here's a case where set and reset are both zero, but the output is one. And here's another case where set and reset are both zero and the output is low. So those points illustrate this idea if set and reset are zero. We can't definitively say x is zero or x is one. It depends. It depends what it was previously. In this case, this output is a one because at this point, set was one, reset was zero. And if set is one, reset is zero, the circuit forces X to be a 1. But at this point, when both inputs are low, X simply stays unchanged. It keeps whatever value it had a moment ago, which in this case was, was 1. All right, is this making sense? Diagrams. Say again? Um, the timing diagrams. Mm -hmm. I have been, I'm trying to, but like, nothing. I'm not sure what, why, how, how, where, where are you getting the actual uh, changes? Ah, so, 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 the goal here is to look at the behavior of this output X, right? So in a truth table, it's pretty simple. Just write all combinations of inputs. And since X only depends on the inputs for a combinational circuit, we know how to write all the combinations of two inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. 
it's trickier with sequential circuits because how do we possibly list all the possible sequences of inputs? You can't do it. There's an infinite number. So how can we decide, you know, what the values for set and reset should be in our timing diagram? There's not a really good answer for that. But whatever the answer is, right, these are inputs. And I'm just choosing how I'm going to change these inputs. So imagine you, imagine you built this circuit. All right, so you build this on a protoboard. You got a switch and a switch, and you've got your output X. And you're, you're at the point now where you're saying, what does this circuit do? Well, what, what does any good engineer do? You start flipping switches, right? And looking at the LED and you flip the switches and now the LED's on and you flip it some more and now it's off. And you flip it a certain way and a puff of smoke appears, right? So, so you play around with, with stimulating the inputs in different combinations and different orders or sequences and you see what the light does. Okay, that's what a timing diagram is trying to display. So, so why did I start this low and this high and then drop this here and then raise that there? I was just flipping switches, right? And, and... Yeah, yeah. And so on, on your first homework question, you've got a different circuit and, and it asks you to draw a timing diagram, exactly the same thing. You're going to want to play around with it, right? Not you, you could build it, but they just want you to analyze it on paper. So, you know, chase your inputs. Say, okay, if these are both zero, what happens to the output? And it goes through there and play around with it. And that, that circuit in question one on the homework is very interesting because there's some combinations of inputs where the output does some really strange things. It'll oscillate, right? And so, so you experiment with it and you say, you know, if I keep this there and I keep this here, not much happens. Okay, so, you know, I'll show the output there, but now I want to change something. And, you know, maybe if I change the reset line three times in a row, something weird happens. So I would show that, and then I'd show what happens to the output. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so um, is the set the more influential variable here? Um... Actually, reset is. So the, the terminology you'll see in the book is reset dominant. This dash is a don't care, right? Which means basically if both inputs are one, well, this is telling you if reset is one, it does not matter what set is. It goes ahead and sets the output to zero. Because, you know, if we think of this as set the output to 1, and we think of this as reset the output to 0, what if you turn both of those switches on? It can't do both, so which one is it going to do? It's going to follow the reset switch. So the reset is actually the one that, that takes precedence, in some sense. Welcome. Alright, so taking a quick glance through homework four, um, question one is this funny circuit, right? So it has a single inverting element here. The output goes into an AND gate. This input of the AND is called S. This is an inverter. The bubble is on the input. doesn't change anything. This is still just a, the same as if we had a triangle with a bubble on the output. So the output of this circuit is the complement or the inverse of the input. So it's R bar coming out here. And the question just wants to know what this circuit does. So explore it, right? Set both your inputs to zero, set them to one, zero, zero, one, one, one. And then think about, you know, does the order of those changes have some effect? If the output is zero and I change R to a one, does that do something different than if the output was a one and I change R to a one, right? So, so the goal here is not, you know, to get the correct answer. The goal is not to, you know, figure out what the timing diagram is that your teacher wants to see. The goal is to explore this circuit 
right, to analyze it by, by putting in different values, looking at the output, seeing how it feeds back, and what you call chasing your inputs, right? Because your inputs come in here, and they go through, and they come out this NAND gate, and they come back around into the AND, and so on. So it's an analysis question. Uh, question two we are skipping. Question three is asking you to, well, we're going to go back and review and then talk more about flip-flops in a few minutes. Um, but we talked a little about this idea of setup and hold time, right? So, so before a clock changes, our input has to be stable a certain amount of time. And after a clock changes, the input has to be stable. Well, here's the input, EI, that's called the excitation input. And here's the clock. And so we can draw this little, you know, sort of um, required quiescent period around the clock signals that say, you know, right here, clock has to, uh, clock's getting ready to tick, the input has to be stable. And then right here, after the clock has ticked, the input has to be stable. And so this, this is showing an example of... Um, an input sequence zero one zero one. So here the input is a zero, the clock ticks. Here it's a one, the clock ticks. Here it's a zero, the clock ticks. Here it's a one, the clock ticks. And the clock events here are changing from one to zero. There's nothing magic about saying the clock changed from zero to one, which says, hey, that's the tick. That could be the talk, right? So you listen to a ticking clock, it says tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, right? Which one of those is louder? It depends, right? So, so in this example, the action of the clock occurs when the clock changes from one to zero. In the version that you're going to work on, the action of the clock occurs when the clock changes from zero to one. So your solution will look similar to this, but it's for a clock that's changing from zero to one for the clock event, and you want to do an input sequence of this. And your only, your only requirement here is, you know, your, your excitation input should have these values on each of those positive going clock edges and make sure that the inputs don't change during this gray period. And then question four takes off in a new direction. So question four, the one you're going to work on, is trying to implement a positive edge trigger D flip-flop. Um, trying to use a positive edge trigger D flip-flop to create a positive edge trigger T flip-flop, a toggle. And this is, this is the beginning of, of a synthesis question. And so we're going to start talking about state machines today, and we'll see some ways that we can create various sequential behaviors using, for example, D flip-flops. And thinking about those ways will help you figure out how you might get this particular sequential behavior that we associate with a T flip-flop. So we're going to go back, we're going to review flip-flops next, but that's, that's kind of an overview of the homework. Um, so we can keep those in mind. All right, questions? This, this is, to me at least, the funner part of the course, right? Because sequential, combinational logic is, is great for, you know, building a traffic light controller that just responds to where the cars are. But if you were building an actual traffic light controller, right, you don't want the lights to just change as soon as a car shows up. Because there might be, you know, a car going through an intersection, and now another car shows up, and if that car immediately gets a green light, you're going to have a problem. So in, in an actual traffic light controller, we wouldn't just say, hey, there's a car sitting to the east, let's give them a green light. We would say something like, hey, there's a car sitting to the east, but we just gave south a green light, like half a second ago. Let's wait a few seconds. And then let's change that light to yellow, and let's wait a few more seconds. 
and then let's change that light to red and now make east green. Right, whereas if east is green to begin with and the car shows up on the east, we don't do anything. We don't make a light yellow. We just we just let the light stay green. So so there's this behavior that's based on what's happened in the past or what's based on the current state of the system. So we'll we'll use the word state a lot over the next few weeks. State is just kind of, you know, the current situation. So what's the current state of this traffic light? Well, um, this light is green, these two lights are red. Or this light is yellow and these two lights are red. Or all the lights are red, maybe. Because there's an ambulance coming through. So state is, is just a fancy word of saying the current situation. And it's really based on, um, there's going to be memory in these circuits. What's in the memory? What are the current ones and zeros stored in the memory of some circuit? All right, so let's, let's go back and revisit um, latches and flip-flops and then start designing more complex circuits with those. So this was an SR latch, a set reset latch. And, you know, two cross-coupled NOR gates. If we do this with NAND gates like we did on Monday, it works the same except the reset is what we call active low. You have to force the reset to a zero to reset the output. You have to force the set to a zero to set the output. But the basic behavior, the cross-coupled feedback and so on, is, is exactly the same. And then we, we noted that, you know, sometimes what we'd really like to do, instead of having two inputs, one to make a 1 and one to make a 0, is just have a single input D and have an input like load. And say, hey, when the load line is high, take what the D input is, latch that inside this device and show it on X. And this is more like, like how we think of memory, right? You're looking at things through the shutter of a camera and when you click the shutter button it captures whatever is coming through the lens. And that's what's preserved on the film, the memory, right? And so, so this D latch is, is closer to kind of our intuition of remembering a bit value. But it turns out we can make a D latch out of an SR latch. And we could do it like this. Now last time I did this with this active low SR latch. We'll do it with an active high one this time. So here's, here's an SR. And here's an output X. So, well, you know, if load is zero, we don't want anything to change. But if load is one and D is equal to one, we want the output to become high. So we could take um, load and D and add those together and feed that to the set input. So if D is high and load is high, this input will be a one and we'll store a 1 into this latch. And if D is low, and load is high, well if D is a 0, the inverter's output will be a 1, we'll have a 1 and a 1. This output will be high if load is high and D is 0, and we'll connect that to the reset line. And so the behavior here is D load X. If load is zero, it doesn't matter what D is, X is unchanged. If load is one and D is one, X is one. If load is one and D is zero, X is zero.
All right, so those those were latches. And they're they're a good introduction to to memory elements. But then we we looked at kind of a a simple example of trying to build something like a computer circuit using latches. And the timing diagram for a latch, you know, looks like this. So when the load line goes high, the output matches the input. So the gate is open. And then when the load line goes low, the output is latched. So all of this stuff in here, while the load line is high, we say the, the gate or the latch is open right and the output X matches the input but once the load line is low this region over here the output never changes even though D might still change over here X was low D changed but the output didn't change so this is where the the gate is open right the input can go to the output here's where it's latched and the downside we saw to that in terms of building a computer circuit is you know, if our load line is high for too long, our output will change multiple times. And in the case of a circuit where the output of this, this latch is feeding back into the input, we're going to get a feedback loop, right? The output's going to change and that's going to affect the input, which is going to affect the output, which will affect the input and so on. And maybe that's what we want, but usually that's not what we want. And so we want, we want a different behavior. And so we want something called an edge trigger device. And this is what a flip-flop is. This terminology is slightly different from the book, by the way. The book sometimes will use the word flip-flop where I'm using the word gate or latch. But I'm, I'm going to try to be very consistent about a flip-flop being an edge trigger device. But edge triggered, level triggered is more accurate, um, less ambiguous terminology. So here's here's what an edge triggered D flip flop would look like. So we have an input D, we have an output Q, and we have a clock. And I've drawn the clock with a little triangle on the input. That means it's edge triggered. So this clock has no effect on the circuit except at the moment when it changes from a 0 to a 1. So we can say this is a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. A negative edge triggered flip-flop would respond when the clock changed from a 1 to a 0. So we call this edge, you know, a positive edge if it's increasing, a negative edge if it's decreasing, 1 to 0. And the timing diagram of this circuit is very different. So, so the action occurs on these positive edges of the clock. And at the moment where that clock changes, the input is sampled. And if the input is a 1, the output becomes a 1. And that's it. It stays there until the next clock event, in this case a positive edge, the input is sampled, it's a zero, the output becomes a zero. And then here's the next clock edge, the input is sampled, it's a one, the output becomes a one. So there's the behavior of a D flip-flop. 
And if this was a latch, right, as long as this, this load line was high, the output would follow the input. So we would see this little dropout right here. And we would see this little bump right here. But with a flip-flop, that doesn't happen. With a flip-flop, we only look at the inputs on this clock edge. And so, you know, it's a knife edge. It's an instant in time. And exactly at that instant, that's when we sample the input and we change the output accordingly. For a D flip-flop, the output just matches what the input is. But there's other, there's other flip-flops that behave differently. And being a physical device, this is not actually a knife edge. It's not actually an infinitesimal moment in time. It's actually, you know, a little bit of time before and after the clock edge. So a little bit before, a little bit after. And when we design with these, these flip-flops, these edge trigger devices, we make an assumption. And the assumption is, you know, for some little bit of time before and after the, uh, the clock edge, the input does not change. So everything from here to here, the input was 1. Everything from here to here, the input was 0. Everything from here to here, the input was 1. Okay, that makes our analysis much simpler. But if our input was to change, you know, right before this clock edge, funny things can happen. So if our clock is right here, there's this requirement that a certain amount of time before and a certain amount of time after. Bye, have a good day. Bye. See you afternoon. Bye. All right, bye. Certain amount of time before and after the edge, the inputs have to be stable. And so this amount of time that we need to keep the inputs unchanged before, this is the setup time. And it's sometimes written as tau with a subscript SU for setup. Tau is Greek letter T for time. And the amount of time we have to be stable after, this is called the hold time. And that's sometimes written as T with an H for a subscript. Say hold time. So if you go to your component specifications, and let's just pick out a um, dual positive edge trigger D flip flop, a 7474. So this, this is a typical picture of a flip flop. So 7474. Um, it's got two flip-flops inside. Why? Why does a 7404 have six inverters? Why does a 7408 have four AND gates? Because these chips come in standard sizes. And, you know, 14 pins, 16 pins are the most common sizes for these integrated circuits. And if you've got the extra space and you've got the extra pins, you may as well use it. You could put in a single flip-flop but if you've got enough pins to put in two put in two right so this has got two independent D flip-flops and here's a picture of one of them you can see the little triangle here that's the clock input that says this is a positive edge triggered device and that input comes from pin 3 it's called clock 1 this pin down here it's not labeled in the little picture but that's the D input and that comes from pin 1. Up here we have the Q output and if we follow that wire uh, fo sorry down here is the Q output if we follow that wire it says Q1 the other output if we follow that that's Q1 bar and pretty common with these devices you get a pair of outputs you get Q and you also get the complement well why is that? Because the way these circuits are built right 
if this is X, this is generally going to be X bar. Your circuit is already generating an output and the complement of the output. So you just go ahead and you run a wire from that part of your circuit and you've got an extra output and it might save you an inverter. And again, you've got the pins, you've got the space, go ahead and use it. So this is a D flip-flop. There's the clock input, there's D, there's the output Q, here's the inverted output Q bar. This has two additional inputs. There's an input labeled clear 1, which goes up here, and there's an input labeled PR or preset 1, which goes into the bottom. These are, are inputs you can use to force the output to a 1 or a 0. And so it says this is a dual positive edge trigger D flip-flop with preset clear and complementary outputs. And important sentence here, a low logic level on the preset or clear inputs will set or reset the outputs regardless of the logic levels of the other inputs. So we would sometimes call these an asynchronous preset and clear input. They don't depend on the clock. And it says a low logic level causes those to change the outputs. Well, in this diagram, there's a little bubble on these inputs. That bubble is a, a notation that tells us these are active low. And active low, remember, is this idea that for an input to do its thing, it should be low instead of high. So if you're a clear input, what is your thing? What do you do? What's your purpose in life? I clear the output. That's my thing. If I'm an active low clear input, I do my thing when I am low. So you put a zero into that input, the output gets cleared. If this were an active high clear input, it would do its thing, clear the output when the input was high or one. So with, with some experience, this diagram tells you everything you need to know about this device. But there's also a truth table. Right, which is now a function table because it, it doesn't just have ones and zeros in the outputs. So what's the function table telling us? If the preset input is low, the clear input is high, then the clock input does not matter, the D input does not matter, the output will go high and the complemented output will go low. So this first row tells us, hey, if you pull the preset line to ground, you leave the clear line high, that's all you need. That will force the output to go high. That's what preset does. On the other hand, if preset is left high but clear is pulled low, clock and D don't matter, the output will go low. If you happen to pull both preset and clear low, which is kind of a weird thing to do, it's like, you know, two people shouting at you at once, and one person is saying, you know, write a zero on the board, and the other person is saying, write a one on the board. What are you going to do? Right? Are you going to write a zero or a one? Well, it does a funny thing in this case. Um, both outputs, the Q and the Q bar, go high, but with a little footnote here, and the footnote says, this configuration is non-stable. Right? So, you know, you're telling this thing to do two different things that are that are in conflict with one another. So we don't usually want to have both of these inputs low. All right, if both of these inputs are high, you're not telling it to preset or clear. And so now it's acting like a sort of traditional D flip-flop. And the behavior is when the clock changes from zero to one, that's what this little up arrow is, and there's a footnote down here, this is the positive going transition. On the positive edge, if D is high, the output goes high. On the positive edge, if D is instead low, the output goes low. And then if the clock is simply low or if the clock is high, right, if the clock's not changing, the D input is ignored. And the way they've drawn the output here is they've said the output is Q0. And the footnote down here, Q0 is the output logic level of Q before these given input conditions were present. 
So that's another way of saying Q does not change. And we also had a notation where we, we labeled this output Q plus to mean what's the new value of Q. And then here we could simply write Q to say it's the same as the current value of Q. But almost always with these sequential elements, there's some, some notation to indicate the new value of an output in terms of perhaps its old value. Although in some cases the old value doesn't matter, right? If I set clear high and preset low, the output goes high. It doesn't matter what it was a moment ago. It forces the output right there to be high. All right, the other thing I want to look at in here is um, is some of the timing involved with this device. So switching characteristics, switching is a fancy word for, you know, changing between zeros and ones. And so there's always a switching um, table in these data sheets that tell you how quickly um, certain things can happen. So propagation delay from a low to a high level output, right? 35 nanoseconds max or 25 nanoseconds max. It depends on what your output is connected to. But you know, ballpark 25, 35 nanoseconds. So not terribly fast. And and for this particular device, changing from a, a low to a high um, with the preset input, a little faster, 25 to 35 nanoseconds as opposed to 30 to 35 nanoseconds for a high to low, right? So if, if you care about the precise uh, timing of this device, right, you can find that in this table of, of switching characteristics. Um, there's also a maximum clock frequency, and we're going to talk about this more the second half of the course when we start developing state machines, second half of, of today, not the course. Um, and there should be setup and hold times in here. I don't see those. I think they've subsumed that into the maximum clock frequency. But a lot of times you'll see setup time and hold time listed in here. And it tells you how long before and after the clock edge you need to uh, keep the input unchanging. Do a quick look at these. This is a different device. You'll use this for your, your final traffic circuit. Um, traffic signal circuit. This is eight um, D-latches, right? So tri-state octal D-type transparent latches and edge-triggered flip-flops. It's a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, but let's see if it lists setup and hold times. Yeah. So um, for these, right, the setup time is five nanoseconds. The hold time is 20 nanoseconds. So if you're changing the inputs, you have to stop changing them um, five nanoseconds before the clock ticks. And then after the clock tick, you have to keep them at their current value for 20 nanoseconds. And if you, if you change them sooner than that, unpredictable behaviors. All right. Um, PF is, is um, picofarads, so a farad is a measure of capacitance, which you may touch on for a few minutes in 120, or you may not, it depends um, on the teacher, but um, capacitance is, is a, it's an ability to resist change in current, basically, or voltage. And so pico is is a really small multiplier. It's it's ten to the minus twelve. And so a pico farad is is a trillionth of a farad. Um, so tiny little capacitance, but it it affects how quickly things can switch. Um, all right. So that's that's um, that's a D flip flop. And let's um, 
round this out and talk about our other flip-flops and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll start designing with these things so um the next flip-flop we talked about was an sr and it's similar to an sr gate and i don't think we actually use these in practice um but they pop up in the book and so here's Here's how this works. And I'll go back to this notion where I list the new value of Q. And so, so, um, if the reset is set to one and set is set to zero and the clock ticks, the output goes low. If set is asserted and reset is, is clear and the clock ticks, the output becomes one. And if neither is asserted and the clock ticks, the output is unchanged. And if both are asserted and the clock ticks, uh, it depends on the device. It might be set dominant where the output would go to one, it might be reset dominant where the output goes to zero, or it might say this is a forbidden combination of inputs and the behavior is unpredictable. All right, there's a T flip-flop, so these are flip-flops. And again, nothing happens until the clock ticks. So um, if T is a zero, Q does not change. If T is a one, Q goes to the opposite value. If it was a zero, it becomes a one. If it was a one, it becomes a zero. And then these are combined into our, our probably most useful flip-flop, which is called a JK. And so two inputs and a clock. So if both inputs are zero, the output is unchanged. If K is a one, the output is reset. If J is a one, the output is set. But then here, if both inputs are a one, the output toggles. So JK flip-flop is like a set reset, but in this undefined state, we act like a T flip-flop with a T equal to one. And so these are, are you know, the most common flip-flop to design with because they get you the benefits of both an SR and a T. So, so we'll work with these a lot after break, um, and we'll write these tables down frequently because we're going to refer to them every time that we're working with these these elements and building building up circuits from them. Um, and so this is this is really kind of the takeaway of what a JK flip flop is or what a T flip flop is and so on. But but I want you to to you know understand conceptually how they behave. Right, and this is this is sort of the shorthand version of writing this, but there's there's a lot going on here, right? There's this notion of this edge um, triggered behavior, where you know everything before and after the the clock changes is irrelevant, and the only thing that matters is what happens at that clock edge. But it turns out that that constructing a um, an edge trigger device can be done with two level trigger devices. Um, so, let me just show you how you build one of these using one of these, or two of these, and then we'll do a break. Um, 
So, these are level trigger devices. And we're going to connect them together like this. We're going to have a D input to this first latch. So this is a D latch. This is a D latch. We're going to take the output of this first latch and feed it to the input of the second latch. And we're going to do something funny with the load lines. I'm going to make an input over here called clock. And I'm going to do this. This is not exactly how I would do it, but this is a simpler drawing. I'm going to label this D. I'm going to label this Q. And this is now a D flip-flop. And how does this work like a flip-flop? Well, suppose our clock is equal to, uh, to zero. So if my clock is zero, I have a zero here, and I have a one sitting over here on the load line. And whatever the D input is doing, it's going up and down, going up and down. That value is coming into here, going through the X output, and sitting here at this input. Now this load input is zero, so none of those D changes are coming out to Q. Q is absolutely stable. But at the moment that clock changes from a 0 to a 1, what happens? Well, two things. One, the current value of D, which was coming out of this first latch's output, is set here on this D input. Clock is 1, this load line is 1. That current value of D appears on the output. Right. So at the moment where the clock rises from 0 to 1, the output now reflects the current value of the input. But at that same moment, since our clock is a 1, this load line becomes a 0. And now any further changes on D don't come to the X output, because the load line is low. And so all of these subsequent changes to D are ignored and our Q output is stable. So we've captured that, you know, edge of the clock tick behavior. And now when the clock goes back to a zero, well, this will become a one, so the D inputs will start changing the X output again. But this load line goes low. Those D input changes that come out of this first latch's output, they're ignored by the second latch, and our output Q is still stable. And so if you chase your inputs on this and draw a timing diagram for it, you get exactly this behavior, where the only time the output Q changes is when the input clock changes from a 0 to 1. And so a, a D flip-flop is really just a pair of D latches hooked up in this way, using this this double arrangement where we have we have a leader and a follower and whatever this thing is is doing is followed by this but only when the clock rises so that's another circuit to to think about and and analyze and draw some timing diagrams for it to to get some further ideas of how we design with, with these devices. All right, so it's 9 o'clock now, so we are going to take a five-minute break, and then um, I want to start looking at circuits we can build using these devices. So we'll start developing um, some more ideas leading up to state machines, right, more complex systems that, um, that perform sequences of actions in response to input changes. So let's take a break. Let's do... Um, Let's come back at 9, 11. So I'll see you in about five minutes.
So let's um, let's start designing some circuits using flip flops. Um, and the first circuit I want to show you is is actually not a good design. It violates a, a sort of fundamental rule about using flip flops, which is we don't really want to mess with the clocks. We usually you know have a bunch of flip flops. We want all the clocks connected together. But this is such a convenient circuit to build, and it's actually a circuit you'll work with in an upcoming lab. Um, and this is this is implementing a counter using T flip flops, and it's it's a good um, exercise in thinking about how T flip flops work, and um, and thinking about how we can we can get these devices to work together. So let me show you a really simple circuit here. We'll use three T flip-flops. And I'm going to set all of the T inputs to one. So if, if T is one, what does a T flip-flop do? Every time the clock ticks, it toggles. So there's, there's nothing conditional happening here. Clock ticks, the output flips. Clock ticks again, the output flips again. And I'm going to take my original clock input, and I'm going to feed that from some external signal that I'll just call a clock. But I'm going to, um, to take my Q bar output of this first device and feed that to the clock input of the second device. And I'll take the Q bar of the second device and feed that to the clock input of the third. All right, well this this will do something interesting. So let's let's draw a timing diagram and let's just suppose our clock is running at some fixed rate. And let me take the Q output, and let me call this Q0, Q1, and Q2. All right, Q0, let's just suppose it starts off low. So when the clock changes from 0 to 1, Q should toggle. So here's a change from 0 to 1. Q0 was low, it'll go high. And it'll stay there until the next positive edge on the clock, and it'll toggle again. And at the next positive edge, it will toggle again. And each time our input clock changes from 0 to 1, our output Q0 toggles. So we get something like this. And do you notice anything potentially interesting about this signal compared to that signal? It's double the length. Yeah, it's double the length. So the period of this signal is twice the period of that. Equivalently, the frequency of this signal is half the frequency of our clock. So this is going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is going up, up, down, down, up, up, down, down. It's going at half the frequency. Well, Q0 bar, and I'm ignoring propagation delays in these diagrams, by the way. Q0 bar is just going to be the opposite. And that's our input to this second flip-flops clock. So if we look at Q1, and let's suppose it started off low, Q1 is going to toggle every time that its clock changes from 0 to 1. Well, where does that happen? It happens right here, and right here, and right here. So if Q1 starts off low, it's going to toggle right here, because that's where the clock input changed from a 0 to 1. And then right here, the input changes from 0 to 1, the output toggles, and here it changes from 0 to 1, so the output toggles again. And so Q1 bar is the opposite of that. And Q1 bar is feeding the clock of this second flip-flop, 
And so Q2, supposing that started low, it's going to toggle every time that its clock changes from 0 to 1, which happens right here. So if we if we pick off some values At this point, Q0 was a 0, Q1 was a 0, Q2 was a 0. So our 3-bit output at that point was 0, 0, 0. At this point, Q0 was a 1, Q1 was a 0, Q2 was a 0. So our output was now 0, 0, 1. At this point, Q0 was a 0, Q1 was a 1, and Q2 was a 0. Our output was 0, 1, 0. And at this point, Q0 is a 1, Q1 is a 1, Q2 is a 0. Our output was 0, 1, 1. And now at this fifth point, Q0 is a 0, Q1 is a 0, but Q2 is a 1. Our output is 1, 0, 0. So if we look at these three outputs as a 3-bit number, this circuit is counting, going from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and if we kept going, it would go 5, 6, 7, and then it would flip back to 0. So this is, this is one way to design an n-bit counter, is to take nt flip-flops and hook them up in this way. Take the, the output of one, connect that to the clock input of the next. And it's happening because basically a toggle flip-flop, if you set your T input to 1, has this fundamental behavior of cutting the frequency in half. And the way that, that counting works, right, however frequently this bit is changing between 0 and 1, this next bit should change half as frequently. And this third bit should change half of that frequency, and so on. So that's, that's a way to make a counter, and there's, there's a counter you'll work with later, 74 and 97, um, in one of the labs. And the data sheet will show you what the circuit looks like internally, and it'll look basically like this. And one, one other notational thing here, so this triangle means an edge trigger device, right? So a symbol that you'll see sometimes would be a triangle with a little bubble on the front of it, right? And this goes into a clock. So this is a negative edge trigger device. This is a device where when the clock changes from 1 to 0, the action happens. And again, this is just a notation. It doesn't mean there's actually an inverter there. But it's a notation saying, hey, when our input changes from 1 to 0, the effect is if we were to invert that, the thing going into the triangle changes from a 0 to a 1, which is, which is what we think of as, as edge-triggered. So it's, it's kind of like when we put a zero on a preset line to say it's active low. This is a way of saying negative edge triggered. And so when you look through a catalog of, of components, you'll see things like, you know, dual negative edge triggered uh, JK flip-flop with asynchronous reset and synchronous clear, right? And all of those, those adjective means something. Um, asynchronous means the action happens regardless of the clock state. Synchronous would mean it only happens when the clock ticks. Negative edge triggered means it happens on this edge, and so on and so forth.
All right. Any questions up to here? Because I want to start kind of a new level of, of using this stuff to design state machines. Um, using a negative edge instead of a positive edge, really not a whole lot of difference. But sometimes the way that we, we end up designing our circuit, we might need an inverter. And, and so using a negative edge would make more sense. Um, for example, here I took the inverted Q outputs and fed those into the clock. Well, I could have made an equivalent circuit using negative edge trigger devices like this. Well, if this was a negative edge trigger device, I could take Q and feed that in. And I could take Q and feed that in. And if this was also negative edge triggered, I would still have a counter. But the whole counter would be negative edge triggered. But I'd, I'd be using the same bits that I'm generating from my output of my counter. I'd be using that to drive the... Um, the clock input. Um, negative edge triggered is more common than positive for a variety of reasons. Um, when you actually build circuits, um, a lot of times what we do is we have a voltage um, pulled up through a resistor to VCC 5 volts. And when we want to change it, we simply connect it to ground. So this is, this is, you know, like the switches that we use in this course. The normal state of this output is to be a logic one. And the temporary state when we want to change it is to close this switch, make it a logic zero. And then we release the switch and it goes up to a logic one. Well, sometimes the change from one to zero happens a lot quicker than the change from zero to one. So if we looked at a timing diagram for a clock, it might come down very quickly to a logic zero. And then to go to a logic one might take more time. The reason being the, the way we pull this up to a logic one involves a resistor. And capacitance came up a little while ago, right? There's capacitances in here, and when you have resistors and capacitors together, you get a timing delay. This is how you actually make circuits that, that utilize a delay to make things like oscillators, and ultimately things like radios. So sometimes the transition from 1 to 0 is faster, because in this case, right, we're making a direct path from this point to ground. Whereas when we release it, we have to go through a resistor, we have smaller current here, eventually bringing you up to 1. So if you want a really sharp knife edge on your clocks, you might want to make your action edge the negative edge instead of the positive. Very similar to, um, to a light bulb staying on. Also very similar to if you have a, um, a laptop with a charging brick, you know, that you plug in, there's a big box that gets hot and it has a little green light on it. After you unplug it, that light will typically stay on for maybe a few seconds and it slowly fades out. That's a result of capacitances inside the circuit. And even though you're not putting any juice into the box anymore because you unplugged it from the wall, there's still charge in there and that charge is slowly trickling away, right? So the fact that that charge does not change instantaneously, that's what's causing this kind of thing, these slow transitions. Cool. Yeah, excellent question, excellent, um, excellent conversation there. All right, any other questions? All right. State machines. So this is this is basically the remainder of the course, right? Until like the last week. Um, 
is looking at state machines and state machines are are computers are an example of a state machine um, in some ways of analyzing it the universe is a state machine um, with with possibly some some unpredictability to it um, so a state machine is is a way to to describe a circuit that you know responds to input changes um, but in a more complex way than just you know if these are the inputs these are the outputs so again the traffic light controller if there's a car sitting on the east it does not mean the eastern light is green All right because if the southern light is currently green when a car shows up to the east first the southern lights gonna turn yellow and it's going to hang out for a few seconds, and then it's going to turn red and hang out there for a few seconds, and then the eastern light will turn green. So, so these are are the more useful version of digital logic, right? Things that that are more than just combinational, and um, there's lots of different ways to describe circuits like that. But let me show you a general picture of what we can consider a state machine. And so um, there's usually two pieces to this. There's some sort of memory. And the memory stores the state, right? Again, the state we can think of as just kind of the current situation. Well, we have to have a, a recollection of what the current situation is. Which lights are green? Which lights are yellow? Which cars are present? That's all part of a memory. So ultimately, this is a bunch of flip-flops. And the outputs of the memory go through a series of wires. And so if you draw, you know, an arrow like this, it usually means a wire in a schematic. If you draw a little vertical bar, a diagonal bar on it, this represents what we call a bus. So this, this means a collection of, of one or more wires. And I'm not specifying how many, but if you had, you know, 12 bits of memory, you might have 12 wires coming out of here. So this represents, you know, some version of the outputs from this memory. And this goes into another block, which is plain old combinational logic. This is a block that we could describe with a truth table. Based on the inputs, we get some outputs. All right, we also have feedback. So we have the output of the memory feeding another block of combinational logic. And we also have external inputs. And then the output of the combinational logic feeds into the memory. All right, so don't don't worry about this part for now. Let's just think about this part right here. Bunch of flip-flops, block of combinational logic, and some external inputs. And the thing that makes it interesting is the output of the memory, the values of the flip-flops, the Q outputs, get combined with, you know, some external inputs to create new inputs to the flip-flops. And all of this is driven by some sort of clock. And your flip-flops are all edge triggered, so I'm drawing this input, you know, on this block. But the idea is you got five flip-flops in here. They each have an edge triggered clock input. They all get connected to this one clock line.
So how does this work? Well, you know, you set up some inputs, you put on some ones and zeros over here. These are the sensors from the cars or, you know, a timer or, or whatever. And there's some current value in the memory and there's outputs there and all of this gets combined by this truth table logic and it sets up the inputs to the flip-flops, the D inputs, the J and the K inputs, whatever. But nothing changes on the output side until the clock ticks. And at the moment of the clock edge, typically, you know, from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, um, the outputs change based on what the inputs to the flip-flops are. And as soon as those outputs change, they come around this feedback path, they go back into this combinational logic, they get combined with the input, and you get new inputs to the flip-flops. But those new inputs don't change the outputs. Why? Because the clock event already occurred. And nothing will change on the outputs until the clock changes from 1 to 0 and then goes back from 0 to 1. And on that next clock edge, all of the new values of the inputs will change some of the outputs. You get a new set of outputs and those feed back in here. And they change the inputs and now you're waiting for the next clock event. So the output of the circuit changes potentially each time that the clock changes. And while this system is running, you know, external inputs can be modified. And, and they may or may not, in this case, they would not affect the final output until the clock ticks. And so this, this is a type of state machine called a Moore machine. And, you know, the outputs could go through some additional combinational logic to generate the actual outputs of, of the circuit. So here's your external outputs. But this is the main action part of the state machine. Ah, so, so, um, so yeah, effectively, so someone asked back in the day when you were in a word processor and you had to initiate save, would that be like manually changing the clock? Um, in some sense, yes. Um, in practice, you know, if you're using a word processor or some kind of computer, there's a clock that's always running. And when you say save or when you click a mouse button or something, mostly what you're doing is changing these external inputs. And, and the clock is running constantly. But if the inputs aren't changing, chances are, you know, not much is changing on the output. But you could, you could have a system where there'd be, you know, some sort of button that would do something and that button would basically generate a clock tick. Um, but the more, the more uh, typical use case, the clock would be something that's constantly running all the time. And then you specify what you want the system to do through these external inputs. And this is, you know, like a PC. So if you have a PC with a 3 gigahertz clock, this is the clock. And it's going up and down 3 billion times a second. And the inputs are things like, you know, your peripheral devices. So if you have a network adapter, you've got several wires connected to maybe, you know, an Ethernet cable. And those are inputs to some block of logic. You've got a keyboard. Well, if it's a USB keyboard, it's four wires. If it's a, a PS2 keyboard, it's a different connector, right? If it's a very old school keyboard, it might have, you know, 16 wires. Um, but somehow, you know, clicking on the keys changes input to some block of logic inside your laptop. Or pressing a mouse button, or moving the mouse, which, which you know, changes um, what's reflected from the little laser coming out of the bottom. Um, and that, that generates, you know, different ones and zeros. And it's, it's 
almost impossible to believe that this stuff actually works, that it's actually real. But this is this is what goes on inside, you know, a laptop or a smartphone or a microwave oven or a smart refrigerator or whatever, you know. But we don't usually think of it this way, right? People people who are paid really good amounts of money design things called CPUs which are built up out of state machines, right? And and once you have a CPU, you're not thinking about, you know, more machines and clock signals and so on. You're writing code, right? The reason that computers are are so revolutionary, right, is is because they let us describe behaviors for systems with a set of sequential steps, with an algorithm, with a program. But ultimately, that that program is is executing because there's a state machine going through different state transitions each time a clock ticks. And the really weird thing is the really smart people who are well paid who design these CPUs, they're doing that using computers, right? <laughs> And the computer makes it much easier to say, you know, well, I want to build a circuit that does this, and it'll do all the hard work for you. And we're gonna we're gonna get to this at the end of this course. We're gonna play around with a language called Verilog, which lets us write a series of statements that describe how we want a circuit to work. And we can we can make a description like, hey, I want to um, feed in a clock, and every time the clock ticks from zero to one, I want the output to count up. And the program will come up with something like this for us. And then, you know, we could have another program that would take that and turn it into a picture of transistors and resistors and capacitors that we could send to a foundry, a chip manufacturer, and more computers in that plant would move arms on robotic devices to to do optical processes and chemical processes to create the physical chips that turn into CPUs, right, and computers. So so you can step back and wonder sometimes how did all of this get started? Well, that's what's been going on for the past, you know, 70 some years in Silicon Valley and such. Um, So at some level, this is this is at the base of it. All right. So this is a Moore machine. Um, we can change this slightly if we take these inputs and we send some of them into this final combinational logic. That gives us a different type of machine called a Mealy machine. I think there's an E there. And and the only difference between a Mealy machine and a Moore machine, a Mealy machine, the outputs depend not just on the memory values, but also on the external inputs. In a Moore machine, the external inputs feed this combinational logic, which affect the flip-flop inputs, so that when the clock ticks, the outputs change partially in response to those external inputs. In a Mealy machine, some of those external inputs might go directly into this output combinational block. And so it may be as soon as you change one of these, the output changes, even if the clock hasn't changed. So this is back to those two words we use, synchronous and asynchronous. A Moore machine, the outputs are synchronized with the clock. In a Mealy machine, they could change in between clock ticks. And it's not a huge difference and in fact, there's there's ways we can take a Moore machine and turn it into a Mealy machine and vice versa. And so there's nothing we can do with one that we can't do with the other. But it's going to change how we design and how we analyze systems. So we'll we'll talk more about those two types of machines as as we continue developing this. All right. So let's let's do some analysis. And we'll, we'll start with, I'm just going to make this up, I think. Um, 
we'll start with with an example and the goal here is to think about the analysis process right we want to learn these steps for for figuring out what a state machine does and every time we have a circuit diagram for a state machine we're asked to analyze it we're going to go through the same steps right the specifics that we do in each of those steps will change depending on the circuit but but the the steps will always be the same so let's suppose we have a state machine like this so I've got two D flip-flops their clocks are connected together and there's an external input called clock alright I'm gonna call this D0 and D1 the text sometimes would call this D1 and D2 I'm gonna try to always start numbering from zero it's it's a good habit if you're computer science because all of our numbering in computer science starts from zero for good reasons so I'll call these outputs Q0 and Q0 bar and Q1 and Q1 bar and I usually don't bother naming the clocks because they're all connected together so there's really nothing significant about this clock input versus this all right well I'm gonna do something like this I'm gonna take Q0 bar and I'm going to feed it back to my D0 input and I'm also gonna take Q0 bar and Q1 and I'm gonna and those together and I'm gonna put that through an OR gate with an external input I'll call X and I'll feed that into D1 so there's an AND gate there's an OR gate um, and I'll take uh, Q mm, what do I do here I'll take Q1 bar and I'll call that Z so there's my output yeah I'll make it more interesting I'll do an OR gate I'll do Q0, I'll OR it with Q1 bar, and I'll call that Z. All right, so this whole thing is, is a, single, a single circuit, right? I could draw a box around here. And this would look like, you know, something with an X input, a clock input, and a Z output. And every time the clock ticks, you know, the Z output might change. And if X is a 0, the Z output might do something. If X is a 1, the Z output might do something else. And our goal is, let's analyze this, this machine. Let's figure out what this machine does. All right. So we're going to go through a series of steps. We may not get through this today because we've only got seven minutes left. But we'll we'll start this at least. Um, so um, step one: How many states do we have in this system? And this is this is a chapter one homework question, right? We have we have two flip flops. This flip-flop has two possible values. This flip-flop has two possible values. The state of the system is, you know, the particular values in this flip-flop and that flip-flop. So the question of how many states is the same question as how many different states could these two flip-flops be in combined? So how many different combinations of outputs are possible for this, this set of two flip-flops? So if you have two things, each can be a zero or one, how many combinations are possible? So this is this is like the question if you have, you know, 
a collection of art pieces. Yeah. So so if you if you have two bits available to represent something, how many things can you represent? Total of four, two to the two to the second. So there's four states possible. All right. So second step, let's name our states. So we're going to make what I'll call a state assignment table. And our state is based on, you know, what the values of Q1 and Q0 are. So I'm just going to do something like this. We've got two state variables. We've got four possibilities. And I'm going to just call these states A, B, C, D. I could call them, you know, Peter, Paul, Ringo, and, and John. Um, makes no difference. Now, usually we'll end up calling these something like, you know, S00, S01, S10, S11, so that it, it you know, reminds us what the values of the flip-flops are for that state. But for now, I'm just going to call them A, B, C, D. All right, step three, this is the big one. We're gonna make what's called a state transition table. But to do that, we're, we're going to, um, we're gonna do some analysis on this circuit first. Um, so let's find equations for the flip-flop inputs because the whole behavior of the system is based on what's the value of D0 and D1 when the clock ticks. So let's write some equations. So so D0 is equal to what? Well, we can see it's coming out of the Q0 bar output. So D0 is just equal to Q0 bar. D1, on the other hand, is a little more complex. It's the output of an OR gate. One of the inputs is X. And the other input is the output of an AND gate. And the AND gate has two inputs. One input is Q0 bar, and the other input is Q1. So we're finding equations for the flip-flop inputs in terms of the flip-flop outputs and these external inputs. What we're, what we're looking at here is basically, if I know what my present state is, if I know I'm in state B, well, I know this is a 0, this is a 1, so this will be a 1, this will be a 1, this will be a 0, 1 and 0 is 0, D1 will just be whatever X is, and D0 will be a 0, right? So if I know what the inputs to my D flip-flops are, I can say definitively, hey, when the clock ticks, what are the new values of the flip-flop outputs going to be? It's just based on what a D flip-flop does. All right, and while we're in, in the mindset of writing equations, let's write an equation for the outputs of the circuit. In this case, we have a single output, Z, and Z is an OR gate, and one of the inputs is Q1 bar, and the other input is Q0. So there's an equation for Z. All right. Once we have this and we have this, we can kind of forget about this, right? So we analyze the circuit to decide how many flip-flops we have. That tells us how many states we have. We come up with name, names for the different states. And then by further analyzing the circuit, we come up with equations for the flip-flop inputs and for any outputs from the circuit. And then we can kind of ignore the circuit. We've got all the information we need in these two, these two pieces. I have 
have a question. Go I for it. Some time. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, we have four states because we have four outputs coming out of the boxes. No. But we have we have four states because we have two flip-flops. And with two flip-flops, you have two to the two possible combinations. Oh, okay. If we had three flip-flops, we'd have two to the third, which is eight possible combinations. That's actually where I was going with it. Okay, perfect. Perfect, cool. All right. We are out of time, unfortunately, and it's a long time from here to Monday, so, so we'll probably have to rehash some of this. So I'll keep this and we'll we'll quickly get from here back to here on Monday and then we'll see how to set up a uh, state transition table and that's that's the main part of the work in doing this analysis and then once we have a state table we'll be able to draw what's called a state diagram and a state diagram is just a picture like this that will show us once we know how to read it very quickly if we're in a certain state and we have a certain input, what's our new state? What are our outputs? And that'll be the end game for this this machine analysis question is to to start with a circuit diagram and come up with a state transition diagram. And so we'll do that on Monday. We'll finish this example up unless it's a horrible example. I'll try it offline. Um, and then we'll go through a bunch of examples of this. We'll use different types of flip flops. Um, We'll see different types of machines, more machines, mealy machines. And we'll do that um, throughout Monday and probably part of Wednesday. Wednesday is also the midterm. Um, and then um, the following week, we'll switch gears and we'll go to the synthesis question. And we'll say, hey, if I want a state machine that acts this way, what's the circuitry I should come up with? And then when we finish that, then you're a digital logic expert right once once you've got a handle on state machines that's basically our end game um and then and then we'll go ahead and we'll talk about some verilog and that's where the the super fun part of the course is because that's that's where you get to play with magic all right um that's all i got for now so i have office hours tonight lab hours tonight right um from five to eight so if you've got lab questions homework questions and you can come in then definitely do that that's that's dedicated time for this class I also have, you know, common office hours Thursday morning, 6.30 to 9, and then Friday morning from, I think, 7.30 to 8.30. So you can check the website to be sure. But lots of hours available. Um, so if you got any questions about this or you just want to um, go through it in more detail, definitely, definitely come in, right? I'm there all those hours. I'm available. Take advantage of it. Otherwise, have a great one, and I will see everybody next time. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome.